I owe all of you an apology. This is my 50th video, and in all of our time together, there is something that I have never told you. I have concluded many of my videos with some variation of you are probably better off in low-cost, market-cap-weighted index funds, which is a statement that I believe. What I have not told you, and the reason that I think I owe you an apology, is that I do not invest my own money in market-cap-weighted index funds. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. In this episode of Common Sense Investing, I'm going to remind you that there is more to sensible investing than market cap weighted index funds. Before anyone gets upset, don't worry. I do invest in a portfolio of index funds, but they are not all market cap weighted index funds. Market cap weights means that the weight of each company in the index fund matches the weight of that company in the market. For example, RBC makes up 6.57% of the S&P TSX Composite Index, which represents the Canadian market, so XIC, an ETF tracking the S&P TSX Composite Index, holds 6.67% of its assets in RBC shares. In a market cap weighted index fund, you end up with a lot of your money invested in large cap stocks, because they make up most of the market, and a fairly even mix of value stocks, which are stocks with lower prices relative to their book value or earnings, and growth stocks, which are stocks with higher prices relative to their book value or earnings. Take a look at this style box analysis for XIC. You can see that it is mostly large cap and an even mix between value and growth. There is nothing wrong with market cap weights, but there is evidence that certain types of stocks within the market should be expected to do better over time. Two of the most prolific examples are small cap and value stocks. I know this may sound like active management, but trust me on this one. You'll want to hear me out. Let's start with the basics. Index investing is based on financial markets being efficient most of the time. In other words, the market prices of stocks and bonds are right, or as close to right as anyone can get, pretty much all of the time. In an efficient market, the price of a stock contains a lot of information. Expected stock returns are related to risk where higher risk generally indicates higher expected returns. Risk is reflected in prices and the way that prices move over time. There are models, called asset pricing models, that help us to understand the relationship between risk and expected returns. Asset pricing models have evolved over time as our understanding of asset pricing has gotten better. There have been a lot of breakthroughs in asset pricing and financial market research in the last 60 years. And a lot of these breakthroughs have been related to risk factors. Let me explain. If we take two portfolios, one 50% equity and 50% cash, and the other 100% equity, we know that they are going to have different expected returns due to the different levels of exposure to the market risk factor, known as market beta. Differences in exposure to market explains about two-thirds of the difference in returns between diversified portfolios. If we took two portfolios, one with a 10% return and one with a 16% return, their relative exposure to market beta would explain about 4% of the 6% return difference. When we talk about breakthroughs in asset pricing, we are talking about researchers discovering other risks that consistently explain the differences in returns between diversified portfolios. The more independent risk factors that we discover, the more of the difference in returns between diversified portfolios we can explain. There are hundreds of factors that have been documented in the academic literature, but only five or so of them are generally accepted as being true independent risk factors. The two that we are talking about today are company size and relative price, more commonly known as the value factor. I hope you're still with me. I have talked about factor investing in the past, but not like this. Today, we are going deep. I mentioned market beta. Any discussion on factor investing has to start with market beta, it was the original factor. In the 1960s, the primary asset pricing model was the capital asset pricing model, or CAPM. The CAPM looks at the measure of sensitivity between an asset or portfolio and the risk of the overall market. That measure is what is referred to as market beta. A market cap weighted equity index fund would have a market beta of one. A portfolio consisting of 50% market cap weighted equity index fund and 50% cash would have a market beta of 0.5. If the market goes up 10%, the portfolio with a beta of 1 would also go up 10%, while the portfolio with a beta of 0.5 would go up 5%.
It's a measure for the sensitivity to market risk. In its time, market beta was the only way that we could compare two portfolios. If two portfolios had different returns but the same beta, the unexplained portion of the difference in returns would be attributed to a manager's ability to select securities or time the market. A portfolio manager that can take the same amount of risk while delivering a higher return is of course desirable. That excess risk adjusted return is known as alpha, which is the holy grail of investing. The CAPM was the foundation of asset pricing models, but over time, it was shown to be flawed. As I mentioned earlier, market beta is only able to explain about two thirds of the differences in returns between diversified portfolios. What about the remaining one third? The cap M was proven to be flawed when Rolf Bonds wrote his 1981 paper, The Relationship Between Return and Market Value of Common Stocks. He showed that small stocks had consistently had higher average returns that could not be explained by their market beta. In other words, viewed through the cap M lens, small stocks were generating alpha, excess risk adjusted returns. In 1985, the cap M took another blow when Barr Rosenberg, Kenneth Reed, and Ronald Landstein found that stocks with a high book value relative to their market price, commonly known as value stocks, had higher average returns that were again not explained by market beta. Their paper, Persuasive Evidence of Market Inefficiency, was further evidence that market beta does not tell the full story of how the market prices assets. These findings, at the time, seemed to be proof that markets were not efficient. If some types of stocks could have consistently higher returns without any additional risk, then the market is clearly mispricing those types of stocks. If that is in fact the case, then markets are, by definition, not efficient. However, Eugene Fama, the man who originally proposed the concept of market efficiency, had a very strong rebuttal. In 1992, Eugene Fama and Kenneth French pulled together the anomalies that had apparently been disproving market efficiency and brought everything back to reality. They showed that the market was still efficient, but we needed to account for additional types of risk, independent of the risk of the market, in our asset pricing models. Instead of the single risk factor model that had been used for years, Fama and French proposed a three-factor model for asset pricing, including market risk, the risk of small stocks, and the risk of value stocks. When they added in the independent risks of small and value stocks alongside market beta, they made the apparent alpha of small cap and value stocks go away, and they significantly increased the explanatory power of the asset pricing model. Remember that under the cap M, small cap and value stocks appeared to have higher average returns without any extra risk. The three-factor model showed that they had higher average returns because they were exposed to a different kind of risk that is independent of the market. Instead of explaining two-thirds of the difference in returns between diversified portfolios, the three-factor model explains 90% of the difference. At this point, we have three independent risk factors that explain the majority of differences in stock returns. Since then, there have been a few more major breakthroughs, but we are going to stop at the three-factor model today. So why do we care about these risk factors? Each of the risk factors, market beta, size, and relative price, have historically delivered meaningful risk premiums. Let's take a quick peek at some of that data. First, we need to understand how factor risk premiums are measured. The market risk premium is measured as the return of the market, like a market cap weighted index, minus the return of one month treasury bills, also known as the risk-free asset. The size risk factor is measured by the return of small cap stocks minus the return of large cap stocks, which is why it is referred to in the academic literature as SMB, small minus big. The value risk factor is measured by stocks with a high book value relative to market price minus the stocks with a low book value relative to market price, which is why it is referred to in the literature as HML, high minus low. All right, so historically in the US, from July 1926 through December 2018, the market premium was 6.28% per year on average. You get that by owning a market cap weighted index fund like XIC for Canadian stocks or XUU for US stocks. SMB, the size premium, was 1.88% per year on average, and HML, the value premium, was 3.78% per year on average. We are leaving those additional premiums on the table with a market cap weighted index fund. 
When Fama and French came out with their paper in 1992, they were criticized for data mining because they only looked at US stocks. That criticism was promptly addressed with global data, which we now have at our fingertips. We only have data going back to 1990 through 2018, but globally, excluding the US, the market premium has been 2.31%, the size premium has been 0.08%, and the value premium has been 4.29% per year on average. In all cases, the premiums are positive, though clearly in some cases they are more positive than others. Global XUS SMB is not that exciting with a premium of 0.08% per year on average. I address this in detail in my video, The Problem with Small Cap Stocks, but in short, small cap growth stocks with weak profitability make small caps as a whole look kind of bad. If you take them out, which you can do with the right index fund, small caps look much, much better. I want to talk a little bit about persistence. I have heard some skepticism about the factor's ability to continue delivering a risk premium into the future. I would argue that anyone who believes in the market risk premium has to believe in the size and value premiums. They are all based on markets being efficient and accurately pricing risk into stocks. If we do not believe in the size and value premiums, then we should not believe in the market premium either. If we look at rolling 10-year periods in the US going back to July 1926 and through 2018, the market risk premium has been positive 85% of the time, the size premium has been positive 72% of the time, and the value premium has been positive 84% of the time. Can we think about that for a minute? US value stocks have historically been as likely to beat growth stocks as the market has been to beat one month treasury bills. In Canada, value has historically beaten growth over 10 year periods more often than the market has beaten treasury bills. In international stocks, we see the same story, with the value premium being more reliable than the market over 10 year periods, and international small stocks have beaten large stocks with about the same frequency as international market has beaten treasury bills, 88% of the time for the market, and 87% of the time for small cap stocks. We are currently living through a period where small cap and value stocks have not been that great, even for the past decade. From the data that we just saw, this is not abnormal. In fact, it has happened many times throughout history. But remember, we know from the data that this can happen to the market just the same as it can happen to size and value. This decade has been great for the market and not so great for size and value. Periods like this are expected to happen, and historically, it has happened to the market at least as often, if not more often, than it has happened to size and value. The past decade is not a reason to abandon small cap and value stocks. I think that these data are pretty compelling. These factors aren't just some off-the-cuff observation. They play a crucial role in our understanding of financial markets, and they have been as reliable, if not more reliable, than the market as a whole at delivering positive risk premiums over time. I don't know how anyone can ignore this data. Now remember, if you own small cap and value stocks in market cap weights, the weights that they exist in the market, you only have exposure to the risk of the market. To get exposure to the independent risk of small cap and value stocks, you need to own them in weights higher than they exist in the market. Practically, this just means loading up on some additional small cap and value ETFs on top of your market cap weighted ETFs. Unfortunately, there are no good ETFs to accomplish this for Canadian and international markets. There are some good ETFs for getting exposure to US small cap value and value stocks. Adding these ETFs to a market cap weighted ETF model portfolio increases its 20 year historical performance, improves its worst three year performance, and decreases its standard deviation. I have written about this in detail in my recent paper, Factor Investing with ETFs, which is linked in the notes. Now, I do want to add, I am not saying that everyone needs to go and buy small cap value ETFs to be a sensible investor. Just like not everyone needs to go and buy US listed ETFs in their RRSP to increase their tax efficiency. For many people, the simplicity of something like VGrow is the best recipe for success. I do firmly believe though, that anyone who is already slicing up their portfolio for lower costs or increased tax efficiency should be considering an allocation to US small cap value and value stocks to increase their portfolio's diversification, expected returns, and statistical reliability. In my factor-tilted ETF model portfolio that I proposed in my recent paper, 
I have used one third XUU or ITOT, one third IJS, and one third IUSV for the US equity portion of the portfolio to gain meaningful but cost effective exposure to the US size and value premiums. To be clear, I do not invest in this ETF model portfolio myself. I use dimensional fund advisors factor tilted index funds in my portfolio. I try to avoid talking about dimensional on this channel because you can't access their products unless you're a client of my firm or a firm like it that dimensional has approved. My ETF model portfolios are my attempt at making factor investing accessible to any DIY investor. Have you thought about adding small cap and value ETFs to your portfolio? Tell me about it in the comments. Thanks for watching. My name is Ben Felix of PWL Capital and this is Common Sense Investing. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with someone you think would benefit from the information. Don't forget, if you've run out of Common Sense Investing videos to watch, you can tune into weekly episodes of the Rational Reminder podcast wherever you get your podcasts.